Next, let's look at type inference for anonymous functions. Suppose we're inferring the type of the function x arrow e in environment n. That's going to have the type tau1 arrow t2 and generate a set of constraints. Now, yes, I am being careful here. The first of those is a type variable tau1. The second one is a type t2 that might not just be a variable. So let's see where those come from. First off, we introduce a fresh type variable tau1. That is going to be the type of the argument to the function. So we don't know what x is looking at this. You know, maybe you and I as a human could look a little bit further into e and figure it out ourselves with our brains, but an algorithm looking at this a priori is going to have no idea what type was intended for that variable. So the algorithm introduces a new type variable to stand for the type of x. That type variable is tau1. Then we go ahead and infer the type of e in an environment that is extended to bind the name x to the type tau1. So anywhere we go to look up that name inside of e now, we'll get back that its type is tau1, that type variable. Well, type inference of e will eventually return with a type t2 along with a set of constraints. Now, if x is ever used in any interesting way inside of e, that set of constraints will end up talking about tau1. Maybe we'll discover inside of e that x has to be an int or a bool, and so we'll end up with a constraint that says tau1 equals int or tau1 equals bool. That's how we'll figure out the type of that variable. So the type of the entire anonymous function then is the type of its argument, which is tau1, arrow the type of its body, which is t2. Right, so the algorithm picked a type variable for the argument. The algorithm inferred a type for the body. And finally, the set of constraints returned for type inference of the anonymous function is just the set of constraints that were produced by inferring the type of its body, that set C. Let's try an example with an anonymous function. The type of the variable x will be represented by a new type variable. So let's call that alpha. So we want to continue doing inference in an environment that maps x to alpha. And we need to infer the type then of the body of the function, which is itself an if expression. Well, we know how to infer the type of an if expression. We just covered that. The type of the guard we've just looked up inside of the environment. That gives us back alpha and generates no constraints. The types of the then and the else branches are just constants, so those are both have type int uh, and generate no constraints. And then, of course, we need to generate all of the constraints for the if expression itself. We give the if expression a type beta, which is a fresh type variable here that we've introduced, and we record the constraints that the guard must have type that is equal to bool, so that means recording that alpha from here equals bool, and that the two branches have the same type. So whatever type variable will be introduced here for the if expression, beta here must be equal to int because of the int showing up for the then branch, and again equal to int because of the int showing up in the else branch. So as that set of constraints then, if we wanted to simplify it a little bit, we could say that we're left with alpha equals bool and beta equals int. Now, popping up one level, we've finished the inference for the body of the anonymous function. And now we can say that it has type alpha, because that's the type variable we introduced for the argument to the function, arrow beta, because that's the type that was inferred for the body of the function. And that comes along with the set of constraints, which is that alpha equals bool and beta equals int. So now, if you and I look at that as humans, we could say, ah, well, the type of this function then must be bool arrow int. And that's probably no surprise. You guessed that right away when I wrote that down. Later on, algorithmically, we'll need to solve that set of constraints to figure that out. Uh, but for now, we've done what we needed to, which is to collect the constraints.